Hey friends, welcome back. What is art? You know, a lot of times my students, they come into my class and they think, oh, we're gonna learn to paint. But before we ever touch paint, we need to learn to see. That's what today's video is all about. So come with me on a quick journey through art history, through my painting catalog, through pop culture, through images of Spider-Man and just all kinds of stuff. And we're gonna look at all of that super fast as examples of how to see. So let's get to it. If you were in my class on the first day, I'd be standing on the desk and my thumb would be flashing from like folded over my palm to extend it away from my palm, in and out, in and out. And what, what I would say is, where are you looking right now? And the students, you guys would say, of course, we're looking at your hand, we're looking at your thumb. And I would say, good, if you understand that, then we can move forward and start to talk about painting. Because painting and drawing and art, it's a visual language. It's not just about learning to, to render, you know. We have computers that can render. We have photo, uh, you know, uh, cameras that can render. Um, they can paint the light. So what is, our, what is our job? Our job is to learn to see. And after we learn to see, the rest of it is just technical acquisition. So let's practice learning to see. We would do things like this. I would give them a word to say, I want you to, to create the meaning, visual meaning of the word private. And you get four black squares. And here they would do this, something like this. They'd move the black squares to the corners of the space. I would say, hey, would you make something man-made or human-made or made by a woman, right? They say, oh, we're gonna make these four squares into a bridge. You're not allowed to scale, rotate anything, just arrange. And that's what we do in painting. That's what we do in drawing. It's all the illusion of space and we manipulate space through arranging shape, color, form, value, texture. These are the, the, this is sort of the grammar of art. And so as we do this, we start to begin to build the, the foundation for what it is to be a painter. And I love, I love, 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 no matter what the age group is, when we do critique of this project, when we do critique of this project, oh, I, I love stopping the conversation whenever something like this happens. You might have a student say, well, you see how the people are all sitting in corners. They're all kind of like on their own. And I will stop the conversation. I'll say, what people? And then everybody's eyes light up at the obvious thing is that we have been reading this as symbolic. And that's what it is. So let's look at this again. Let's look at this next image. This is an old still life painting I did. I must have been, I don't know. I don't know, 20, 20 nothing, right? Just, just long time ago. I had this dream where I was a little boy and I was walking across this arch domed, you know, like almost like pregnant hill of grass. And the sky was as blue as blue can be. And the grass was as green as green can be. And the sun was as bright as bright can be. And I was carrying a red balloon, this you know, helium balloon floating above me in this picturesque moment that was like, uh, you know, like uh, it's too perfect to be real, right? I woke up from it and I was so filled with the childlike happiness. You remember that feeling of having a balloon when you were a kid? And that was the feeling I woke up with. And I, I just in a sort of a dazed, sleepy stupor, I walked out to the garage and as I walked out there, I, I grabbed a bowl of fruit that was on the kitchen table and uh, the garage was where my studio was at the time. And I just set the bowl down. I took all the fruit out of the bowl and I started painting. I was almost in an unconscious place as I was painting. And if you notice, I, I drew on top of this this painting with this uh, this sort of shape of a balloon, which was literally kind of subconsciously what I was painting. I ended up painting something that, that was a visual representation of the emotional experience of my dream, the happiness of my dream. I did it by, if you divide this painting in half, right, across its, its midline, the buoyancy that I created, the echoing the balloon, the high contrast, candy apple, concentration, saturation, reflectivity even in the shadows there's color even in the shadows there's light reflecting this was the scene i painted i was painting happy right i was painting a simple happy dream with fruit right and it went into gallery and sold instantly it's easy right big bright red simple happy but it proves the point and we're going to the point that we're going to start exploring as we move forward which is it's not what you paint but how you paint it I say Ray, Ray Vanilla, my mentor, one of the Tao Six, one of those famous Disney illustrators that turned fine artist, moved to the Southwest, painted 
in the same spaces that Nikolai Feshin walked and painted and uh, taught me, oh, just about everything that I know. So let's look at some pop culture, though. Um, my mentor, he actually did the um, storyboards for the Aquaman cartoons, if you ever watched those when you were a little kid. We're talking old st- old school stuff. He was old enough to have, have um, been in, you know, kind of occupying Europe after World War II. So old school stuff. But let, let's lean into sort of his, um, his, the treatments of things that he inspired me about. So let's look at pop culture. Let's look at superhero stuff. Um, Anytime we, I'm, I'm introducing concepts about composition to my students, I would talk about line and line energy and some of those very basic things. Anytime you see a Superman poster, you have strong verticals because he's the man of steel. He's, he's super strong, right? So it's strength, verticality, towers, trees, vertical lines. You can see it. It's obvious, right? Then... Spider-Man, just the opposite. Uh, he's all about dynamism, dynamic, energetic, agility, tri- uh, diagonals, triangles, diagonals, diagonals, diagonals. So Spider-Man, right? We could go and look at any movie poster. There's a strong difference between the different line energies and character energies and the way they they create a sort of a, a visual representation of a certain um, line quality, right? And then I always ask my students, actually, you know, I would also have like, uh, you know, other things we look at, horizons, which is like calm and, 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 you know, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So then I will show them this. I'll say, guys, what is this movie about? And all of them will say, you know, because we're, we're, you know, we're looking at slides instead of painting. So we're lazy. We say, we're say it's about aliens. And I'll say, no, it's not about aliens. I said, what is it about? And we break it down. And I say, this grid here is the verticals are strong. Horizontals are calm. We've got verticals and we've got horizontals. We have this grid-like structure. We have order, right? We have order. It's these two guys. They create order in a chaotic universe. They keep us safe. They create order. It's about structure. It's about order. And that's what this movie is about. It's about them keeping us safe. It's not about aliens. It's about these guys that keep the aliens in check, right? And we know that not just from watching the movie. We know it from the movie poster, We know it from the visual design. We know it because look at all of these horizontal lines that fill this page in a grid, right? And then we can look back in art history and we're like, what's going on? Why are so many people going to the Louvre to see another portrait of a woman? How many artists, myself included, are guilty of just painting heaps upon heaps of portraits of of women, right? So here's the thing. We look at this one because something's going on. And my my other mentor was from university. He's a ceramic artist whose work was in the Louvre, so that's why I start here. And anytime he did his lectures in the university, everyone would come. You know how most of the time you have art in the dark, you know, like your art history classes or whatever, and um, and, and the lights go out and, and people just start eating snacks or falling asleep or whatever, and you got those good students who are trying to stay engaged, right? Um, but it's usually not the most exciting part of your curriculum or your course of study. But when he would do these slideshows, everybody would come. It would be like, uh, you know, like when Neo is fighting Morpheus in the Matrix, when he first comes, gets jacked into the thing. That's the kind of thing, you know, is like everybody just circles around to see. And I remember when he was talking about the Mona Lisa, he challenged us. He says, why does everybody look at the Mona Lisa? Why is this the painting that everyone around the world has to see? And there's a lot of reasons why we might say, well, there's this story about it was stolen or this or that or the mysterious smile or whatever. And there's all kinds of things. But there's a fundamental part of it that it has to do with the design as well. And this is the argument he made to us. He's like, you know, if you think about the Renaissance, like, they're masters of perspective. You know, they're putting like gridded tile floors and everything to show how awesome they are at perspective. But in this picture, you have this strange break in the horizon. Now, it could be accounted for with a sfumato in the background, this kind of smoky uh, transitions between the values and you don't know exactly where the horizon ends here. But it seems to suggest that there's a little bit of a of, of a broken horizon line here that there's an asymmetry between one side of her and the other, just like there's an asymmetry on one side of her face to the other. Not just with her mouth, but with her eye as well. Look at that, right? 
So there's something there, like a broken logic, like something's not matching. Additionally, everything you can, I, you could have done it much more than I did, but it's like egg shapes, right? So I'm going to just kind of say this. Looks, so it sounds maybe a bit chauvinist, but it's kind of like this stereotypical kind of uh, egg shape, which is traditionally aligned with the, f the female or the feminine, right? And then you have this broken horizon, which is like a mystery. And so... It's not just like, oh, this painting was stolen. Oh, who is it really about? Who is this girl? It's that in the picture, fundamentally, we have this mystery of the feminine represented in the formal elements of design, that it's there in the structure of the picture. And if we think about it again, it's not what you paint, but how you paint it. So that, that if we then look forward here at this picture, this is in the Sistine Chapel, uh, Michelangelo, in uh painted it and and you know this is in in the pope's home court we go we look at the ceiling and and everybody is looking at this along with all the whole other i mean the rest of it is magnificent too but this is such a central piece of it and it's not just like the moment of creation which is obviously a key piece of of you know many world religions anchoring their origin to this moment and Michelangelo depicting it like he does is the thing though it's not just that it's a religious moment it's not just that it's a moment of of creation it's not just that it's a a tradition that people follow no, it's not just that he's a great artist but here's the why why do we look at this representation of this moment from him more than maybe anyone else and I think it comes again back to the design. Now, people talk about how this is like a cross-section of, of uh, you know, like a human brain. And you can see that he was, you know, it's evidence that he was dissecting cadavers Ill illegally or whatever. Like there's stuff in here that you can talk about, lots of stuff. But let's just talk about the formal elements. So here, look at this. See this curvature here? <laughs> see this curvature here? see how the divine is shaped like the god head is like unfolding out of space time and the shape of that gesture the the, the form it takes of, of space and time unfolding is literally like a perfect mirror like a puzzle piece to match and merge and become one in this gesture the mortal the immortal the human the divine the godhead and Adam and we have this this union where it's it's formally designed to speak to oneness the oneness of all things in this moment creator and created and that in that formal design is something so powerful right and and it speaks to something that whether we read this image correctly or not whether we understand it or not we feel it in our bones we feel it in our bones and yes, there's cool stuff like Eve peeking out from under his shoulder, like I'm coming, dude. And then, you know, their eyes and then that kind of like his his like his weak sort of like hand is just hanging there. And then the powerful gesture of God just reaching in and all of that. So it's there's a lot there. But that formal structure underneath it is what I want to point to and say that's where we want to start. Let's talk a little bit more about axis and energy. <laughs> so um, Robert Frank from his book, The Americans, um, I think he won a stipend. He was, uh, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting now. He's from Europe, Dutch or Danish. I can't remember where he's from, but he um, won a stipend to come and photograph the United States of America. And this was, you know, like 60 years ago. Um, it's an uh, awesome anthology. The book it, of photos is unrivaled. It, it's one of my prized art books and this is one of the most important images to me from the whole series I mean, there's so many but I love looking at this one when we talk about access we talk about energy we talk about line energy we talk about composition and design here we see look at the horizon line look at the horizon line look how diagonal it is look at how askew it is and sure it could create energy and action if you're drawing a comic you might you might put the camera at an angle like that to create some more energy in this in this scene but but look what happens here at this man who's perfectly upright in a crooked world it's so cool what you can do with the tilt of a camera how you can make the world feel askew ajar 
how you can make it feel energized by the camera, but also like create anxiety with the camera tilt, right? And then you have this upright man. And I see this not just in, in the historic photos by Robert Frank, of this man who's like kneeling on trash, praying at the river, but also modern movies. I mean, this is like somewhat modern. This is, this is from uh, 28 Days Later. And look at this. Do you see the background? And an upright man. This is one of those like uh, infection movies or zombie movies. And um, this is like such a poignant scene to me where they find some respite. They find some like reprieve. They find a, a moment of calm, these like protagonists in the story. And in every shot, when they're at this like apartment, in the kind of in the middle of the movie, the camera is, is on the characters uh, with them being vertical like this, like upright. But the whole world behind them is 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 tilted and and it creates this tension and this anxiety. There it is again. Look at the look at the diagonal there. And then look at he's vertical, you know, totally upright. And the same thing with her. And so it's to me, it's an amazing thing to see how visual design is not just where you put stuff but how you put it there, what the axis is, what the angles are, what the line energies are. And there's so much more that we can talk to, talk about. But, it, you know, here's like a work that I'm working on right now. And I'm just, I have tons of reference images. Uh, I love the colors from Carol Mar uh, Marine. I, I have McDonald's iconography. I have all kinds of different things. And I'm just laying it out, arranging it. And as I'm doing it, I'm thinking about all of these things and so much more as I go through and try to understand what makes a good painting, how to arrange the painting, what is my painting about, how am I going to communicate it. And so as I do that, I just wanted to share my thinking because so often I'll just like grab paint and just start working, right? It's like, hey, here's how you do this. Here's the brushes I'm using. Here's whatever. But there's so much more to it, so much more that happens before we ever pick up a brush and just happening in the way that we're seeing the world and how we're digesting it and how we're putting it together and what we're trying to say. So hopefully that was fun. Hopefully that was interesting. And hopefully you learned something. Thank you so much, you guys, and best wishes. Take care.